Tonight's program is very special. Many of us here have worked within our communities to protect our children and our loved ones from the intrusive dominion of the telecoms. And we're going to talk about the wireless world in which we live, and we're going to um, discuss things that will hopefully benefit you and your families and you can take away this information to your friends. One thing I want to mention is tonight's talk is not being sponsored by any of those telecoms. So you know that the information you'll be getting is from an independent source who's uh, not financially motivated to spin the truth. So in that regard, I am honored to present to you two speakers um, this evening. And then once we're done with our presentation, we're going to have a question and answer session. So hold on to your 5x7s or 5x8s, and, um, and we'll collect them at the end and distribute them. So tonight, I'm honored to present Dr. Maggie Havis. Uh, Dr. Havis is an associate professor of environmental and resource studies at Trent University, where she teaches and does research on the biological effects of environmental contaminants. Dr. Havis's current research is concerned with the biological effects of electromagnetic pollution. She has given talks in more than a dozen countries on her research and provides expert testimony on the health effects of electromagnetic pollution. She serves as a scientific advisor to many EMF scientific and advocacy organizations worldwide. Dr. Havis recently wrote with Camilla Reese, Public Health SOS, The Shadow Side of the Wireless Revolution and has co-edited three books and has published more than 100 articles. Dr. Havis. Well, thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure for me to be here tonight. And I'm just going to ask before I start, for those of you who happen to have cell phones with you, if you could please turn them off. Pretend we're on an airplane. Um, and if you put them into airplane mode, that would be much appreciated. favorite quotes that I remind myself of every once in a while to um, keep my spirits up because uh, we're really dealing with a, a very serious problem that's affecting the health of billions of people worldwide. We're up against a massive industry who's making um, so much profit that they can do anything they basically want. In some cases, um, they have far too much political power as well, so they can put antennas wherever they want. And for those of us who are simply trying to protect our neighborhoods and our families, it's almost um, uh, it's such a big enemy that we're really dealing with, such a huge power that we're dealing with. And so I have to keep reminding myself of quotes that uh, keep my spirits up. And this is one of the quotes that motivates me. Liberty cannot be preserved without general knowledge among people. If you know, if you have information, you have choices and you can do things. And that's really what I'm here to do, is to share with you some of the information I have that comes from the science, that comes from talking with people who have developed electrosensitivity. And I'd like to share that with you tonight. Now, I know there are a number of people in the audience who are very well versed in this, and I know some of you are brand new to this issue. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through my presentation fairly quickly. I hope I'll be able to make it understandable to everyone, but we do have time for questions afterwards if there's something that uh, I fail to make clear to you. The question uh, for this present, the title for this presentation is why are we here? And I don't mean that in a religious sense, although we can certainly ask that in the synagogue, uh, but more in a secular sense and more uh, for right tonight. Why are we here tonight? Well, I'm here to share information with you and you're here to do something with that information. Each and every one of you, I think, are here for a reason and it's really up to you as to how you decide to take this information. One of the reasons I'm here is because I'm concerned about wireless technology in the school environment. And that's what I'm going to focus my talk on tonight. Uh, I'm going to show you a very short little video clip of students in Mountain View School and some of the symptoms they began to experience after Wi-Fi was placed in the schoolyard. Hi, I'm Austin Lamont and I'm 14 years old. Uh, I go to Mountain View School. I've been suffering weird headaches 
and dizziness and displacement. Like, it feels like my head is like there's a lot of pressure in my head, and it's like repulsing like this. And I just feel like displaced, and when I'm not there, nothing, nothing happens. So, and like, I get really like weak, and, and like, I can't, it's hard to hold pencil too, and I can't think straight. Starting this year at Mountain View, um, I've been getting a lot of headaches and it's been making me really dizzy. And um, like it feels like like I can't concentrate and you feel like you're not really there. It's hard to explain. The thing that would concern us was that shows got better when shot home. And um, we couldn't figure out what was going on. We got our eyes checked and found out that wasn't it. And Ashley had everything checked and found out that wasn't it. And she still, to this day, when she goes to class, probably about, probably about four out of five days that she's there, she's coming home with a, with a headache. And I mean a significant headache, where she has to take Tylenol or Adam. Um, my children, they are students at Mountain View School. And in the last couple of years, I've noticed um, that my children have had headaches, which concerns me because I don't know many children that do get headaches. My name is Gigi, the Mountain View parents have two kids at Mountain View. One is in grade six, one is SK. My concerns are Georgia used to complain of headaches while in school. So then I decided, okay, we'll take the next step, go to the doctor. So we went and saw the doctor. She interviewed Georgia and asked, you know, if these headaches occurred while in school, at home, and the outcome was they were only occurring, occurring while she was at school. They weren't occurring on the weekends. And now being in a portable, nothing, no headaches. So, I mean, what do you say about that? Strange. As a parent, I wonder how does it compare to a cell phone tower, for example? You know, we've read these studies that show that living within three or four hundred meters of a cell phone tower can increase your chance of all kinds of ailments, headaches, dizziness, um, even cancer and leukemia. What if you measured that? And then what about at our school? Could you measure what the microwaves are at our school where the kids are sitting every day? Even if you measured outside of the windows, right where the kids are sitting in the kindergarten class, could you detect microwaves? about the Wi-Fi and some of the symptoms, it makes me think that um, we don't know enough and that maybe we should be cautious and before it's completely proven safe, um, I would really choose to hardwire all of our computers, which does the same job that the Wi-Fi does. About two years ago, my son started getting some strange sensations, and it was usually at night time. It would last about 10 or 15 minutes. I had like, my eyes, everything looked big, and when my mom talked in bed, everything sounded like really, really loud. Because his bedroom was right over where we kept our computer, I realized later, but he would get really strange sensations at bedtime, and he would call it the weird brain thing. And I'd ask him to, to describe it to me, and he would describe it as uh, the windows and doors were changing shape, and my voice was getting louder and softer. So his perceptions were quite distorted, and I was worried, and I suspected it was the computer. One day, I just I called the phone company, and I just said I wanted to switch to cable, and it was, it was uh, just a matter of changing the modem. He's never had that weird brain thing again, ever. The computer was right under me, so um, it was pretty obvious. <laughs> Out of the mouse of babes. Uh, there are a number of students in the Barry area, right where the, you know the Mountain View School is, who are now going to their doctors, their cardiologists, to find out what's wrong with their heart. Two of the students are on heart medication. One has been scheduled for heart surgery because the doctors can't figure out what's wrong with her heart. The mother decided that she wasn't going to go through with the surgery. I'm talking about, you know, 10 to 15 year old children. The mother decided she wasn't going to go forward with the heart surgery. They wanted to wait to find out what would happen during the summer. 
They had wireless technology in the home, they got rid of it, and the child hasn't experienced any heart symptoms uh, during the entire summer. Unfortunately, September is here, she's going to be returning to school next week, and we will just see whether or not uh, the heart palpitations begin uh, to recover, re re return. Now, there's some things you should know about wireless technology in the school environment. First of all, the Wi-Fi in the school is not the same as your Wi-Fi at home, if you happen to have wireless routers. You have, we have industrial strength uh, Wi-Fi in schools. It's much, much stronger. This is a, an advertisement from the web, the most powerful Wi-Fi in the universe, and this is the way that they try to promote it. Uh, this is us versus them. It's a military analogy that I think is very disturbing. And you can see here that they deploy them from K to 12. I don't understand why children in kindergarten, grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, need to have wireless technology. If they want to use a computer, you can always use it in the wired mode. This is what Wi-Fi would look like in a school environment. Here you have um, the various rooms, and here you have the different antennas. Each of these antennas is radiating, and so basically you have overlap of the antennas. It's like having a cell phone antenna in the building you're in. Most of you are aware that cell phone antennas should be placed near schools, but wireless antennas shouldn't be placed in schools either, where the exposure is much, much higher. Wi-Fi in schools comes in two different frequencies, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. The 2.4 gigahertz is the same frequency we use for microwave ovens. It's also the same frequency we use for certain types of wireless um, cordless phones in our home. It's the frequency that oscillates water the best, and that's why we use it for microwave ovens, so we can heat up tissue uh, very, very quickly. It's also one of the most serious, one of the most damaging frequencies that have been tested. 2.4 gigahertz and 900 megahertz are the two frequencies uh, that some of the, some Eastern Bloc countries tested, and they found that they were much more harmful than either higher or lower frequencies. So we're using some of the most dangerous frequencies for the wireless technology. The reason we're using 2.4 gigahertz is because it's an unlicensed frequency. That means if you have a microwave oven in your home or any other technology at that frequency, you don't require a license for it. As a result, more and more devices are coming out using that frequency because you don't require a license. If you want to put up a cell phone antenna in your neighborhood, you have to have a license, but you don't for 2.4 gigahertz. So it's re reserved for that reason and hence it's proliferating for that reason. We also have Wi-Fi in schools that uses a digital pulse. This is what a digital pulse looks like, and this is what a non-digital pulse looks like. And you can see here um, that there's quite a difference between the two. The studies that have been done looking at digitally pulsed microwave radiation versus unpulsed <coughs> microwave radiation is that the pulse somehow has biological effects. It's more dangerous. And that's been shown over and over and over again. The other interesting thing about this particular graph is that when the Federal Communication Commission decides that they want to find out what you're exposed to, they average the frequency. They don't look at the peak value, which is the one that's biologically active, they look at the average value. And so if you have pulsed frequency in this particular example, it would come out as 20 milliwatts per centimeter squared rather than what people are actually exposed to. For non-pulsed, you can see that it's very close, the pulse versus the the, the uh, peak versus the average are very, very similar. We have hot spots, and the highest levels of microwave radiation in a school environment are going to be right at the computer that has an antenna, and at the antenna that's within the school as well. And so your highest exposure is going to be if you're using the antenna in a wireless mode. And you can just imagine that if you have multiple antennas in a classroom, 30 students, uh, streaming video, you're going to have very, very high exposures. Indeed, it's probably unlikely that you're going to be able to all stream video. It'll slow down the system, so it's an archaic way of using the technology. The solution is to simply put it on wires. So I'm not opposed to people going on using the internet. Indeed, I use it every day. I think it's a very good tool if you know how to use it. It doesn't have to come through the air. It can actually come through wires. So there, there are some people out there who think that you know, by saying you shouldn't have Wi-Fi in the classroom, that we're anti-education, anti-intellectual, we're, we're Neanderthals. Really, uh, the best technology that we can have from a technological perspective is fiber optic. 
It's the fastest, it's the most secure, um, it's, it's, um, it doesn't have interferences, people can't break into it. It's really the best technology and Google and certain uh, of the wireless industries are now beginning to promote it because they can see the future. The future is not wireless, the future is fiber optics in the near term.